What's up, everybody? I'm Jason, and this is episode nine of my live stream slash vlog for 2020. So season three, I guess, is how I'm calling it. Uh, I am streaming this on February 20, Friday, February 26, 2021. And um, this week, we are continuing the discussion of the engineering considerations behind doing synthetic neutral or computational neutral density uh, uh, or neutral density simulation, long exposures using averaging, essentially. Uh, last week, I talked about the benefits, and I realized after going for about an hour on it that uh, it was more to talk about than I could talk about. And, uh, there, there was more involved here to talk about than just talking about one week. So this is armchair camera engineering, for lack of a better word. Uh, I'm, you know, lots of people like to do armchair camera engineering. They like to talk about how they think they know more than a camera company. And I'm obviously not saying that I know more than a camera company, but I did sit down, I did do some math, some testing. I did do some math, I did do some testing um, to see how this whole computational neutral density thing works uh, so that I actually feel like I can talk about it intelligently and with some semblance of uh, understanding of the actual challenges and problems involved. So as I said, last week I talked about why computational or synthetic neutral density uh, long exposure work was useful. This week I want to talk about the actual implementation details of it. So to dig into the implementation of computational neutral density or synthesized neutral density, you have to realize some, some things first. For example, that, or primarily that, this process probably cannot replace the use of neutral density filters in all uh, situations or regimes. And generally speaking, and I'm sure there's other uh, things or other reasons out there, but I've identified two um, neutral density use cases that can, or, or essentially were, is in my experience, neutral density fall, use falls into one of these two use cases. So one use case is for long exposures. It's the blurring water in a landscape. It's causing cars and people to disappear, blurring skies, uh, you know, clouds and skies, that kind of thing. And that's generally going to be like for exposures one second or longer. The other use case is for short exposures. So when you're talking about somebody who's shooting with a very fast lens and shooting video and so they want the the shallow depth of field of a, a really wide aperture but they're limited to needing to shoot at a specific shutter speed for video that so they need to have neutral density to bring the exposure down to something that can uh, you know that's compatible with the camera and conditions that they're working in so uh Short exposures would be things like a 30th of a second and faster. Now, yeah, I know there's kind of this no man's range or whatever between one second and a 30th of a second that, you know, could sort of fall under either side of the thing. So the second consideration that we have to consider is understanding the, the problems that exist with mean stacking or averaging, stacking and averaging, and how the, you know, what our focuses need to be. So, for example, uh, by averaging in camera, so there are, there are solutions uh, using the term because uh, it ranges from a things like magic lantern scripts that will take a certain number of frames to really just uh, using a timer remote to hold the shutter down for however long you want your exposure to be or a timer release uh, 
there are solutions to capture the frames, then you deal with it in post-processing. Uh, so what is, while that works, that's not super ideal, at least in my opinion. In the ideal solution from a, a data standpoint is to do the stacking in camera or the averaging in camera. It minimizes the amount of data you have to store. It minimizes the amount of post-processing production time and just post-production work in general. Uh, the second problem is, is that mean stacking or mean averaging tends to have uh, visual artifacts where the as you switch from one exposure to another exposure to another exposure, the the gaps in the middle leave gaps in time in the frame, and so moving things can become uh, juddery, for lack of a better word. And so, for example, um, actually, let me just bring it up. I've got some pictures that we can look at and it'll kind of show us what they're show you what the what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm a, I'm a little more disjointed than normal in this I think or, or uh, in this video because I am actually trying to do things to put bring computer stuff into uh, the discussion. So if we look at for example this image this was a a full frame, or a, um, this is a quarter second, and uh, this is actually several quarter second images, uh, mean average together in camera on a Canon 5D or a Canon R5. And you can see it's pretty smooth. The each exposure was a quarter of a second. However, the uh, I think this was two exposures, if I have the, could be eight. Uh, it was either eight, two or eight. Um, but this is kind of indicative of like what you would expect if you just put a neutral density filter on. Now, when you go to, here's a 40th of a second exposure. And uh, again, it's stacked and averaged in camera. But you can see that where the fan blade is, that there's the distinct appearance of two fan blades. So there's, it's not just one long blur, it's, in fact, in this case, it's actually a fan blade and then approximately, uh, I think it was uh, 100, 100 to 150 to 200 milliseconds later, another fan blade in similar location. It wasn't just a continuous blur. So... This is an example of the, the problem that you have with artifacting, with stacking images, if the process isn't designed in camera to optimize the uh, process. Now, I've tried combating this, and this is especially interesting with the EOS R5, where you can shoot 8K video, which gives you a 32 to 35 megapixel still, or megapixel image, which is actually a, an image that I would argue is uh, basically sufficient to make a reasonable print from. I have tried to combat this by using video with a nearly 360 degree shutter angle. It basically gives you the fastest readout from the sensor, you know, most continuous readout from the sensor. And the camera side of things works fine. The problem with the uh, stacking is the software side of things. If you shoot a, a two minute clip uh, of 8K video and extract that into, uh, the way I did it is extracted it into uh, PNGs, I think it was, and then tried stacking and averaging in Image Magic on Linux, I basically just ran the system out of RAM. There's, that is, there's so much data that's generated in, uh, you know, that many exposures and that many images and so forth. I'm pretty, pretty confident that 
had the cam computer been able to stack everything and not run out of memory, that the end results would be incredibly good because of the essentially the ratio of exposure time to minimal interframe uh, gap. And then, of course, the final thing we have to look at is the user interface. And the user interface for like average stacking, multi-exposure stuff in Canon cameras or even Nikon cameras or any camera that I've looked at is uh, pretty abysmal, in, in my opinion. It's just not really great. Okay. So the first problem we have to look at is dealing with the, the artifacting. And basically dealing with the artifacting comes down to figuring out how much delay we can have between frames before we start having a, a uh, noticeable separation or problem. So it's pretty obvious to me that unless you get the exposure down to uh, at least equal to, if not twice, the inner frame gap, uh, you know, the exposure to exposure inner frame gap of your camera, you're going to run into problems with visual artifacting from multiple, of fr multiple frames sort of stacking up weird. And in the case of, for example, the R5, if you're shooting with the mechanical or first curtain electric shutter, that's, as I said, about... 15 to 20 or uh, 150 to 200 milliseconds so you know you're talking a quarter of a second exposure kind of works out okay so what is ideal for all of this uh what is the the best that you could do well i would argue that ideally you wouldn't have anything move more than one pixel between frames between your you know in the readout times um, the question then becomes, okay, well, that's I, ideal. Uh, I don't think you're going to, you, you kind of have to have more than zero pixels, which, I mean, I guess technically that would be ideal, but, um, being reasonable at least, what's good enough? Two to four pixels, maybe a bit more. I, I don't have a good answer here. And this is probably the one place where I don't have this great, um, handle on the background for the engineering. I'm kind of making some numbers up here. But ultimately, what's going to dictate whether or not this can be done with a very short interframe gap is the readout times for the sensors and how fast the sensors can be read out, read out. Um, not at least read out into however the sensor is buffering things. So one interesting thing here is rolling shutter isn't a problem with this. And basically there's two ways to read out a, a image sensor for a camera. One is a, a global electronic shutter and one is a rolling electronic shutter. And uh, basically the difference is, is a rolling electronic shutter each line is read out and cleared sequentially across the shutter. And that's basically what's being used on pretty much anything that doesn't advertise itself as having a global electronic shutter. Uh, in the case of the R5, shooting video or shooting with the electronic shutter, it is a rolling readout. However, the readout performance is uh, phenomenally good. The, there's a small amount of artifacting, but it is, it is in, I, I'm very impressed by how quickly Canon can read out the sensor in the R5. Uh, now in the case of a global shutter, the, basically what happens is it works in a process that's somewhat similar to a rolling shutter, except there's buffer memory on chip for the sensor to be read out to, and then that's what's transmitted or, or re, uh, converted and processed out to the, the, the CPU or the processor for the camera. Uh, it, the exact details get a little fuzzy, but, or, or a little complicated, but essentially it's, those are the two sort of options.
So the first question we can ask, and I, I didn't make this clear at the start of this video, I really should have, but I did make it clear in the previous video, is as an EOS R5 user, I'm an EOS R5 user, I'm tending very much to uh, formulate this whole discussion in the vein of talking about the EOS R5. So that's that's my reference point. If I shot something else, I would be talking about it almost certainly in the vein of, you know, a Sony Alpha or a Nikon Z or whatever. Uh, that because I shoot an R5, that's what I'm thinking about. And that's also the only camera that I have. Oh, well, not the only camera, but the camera that I'm doing some of these test things on. So the question is, is kind of how is how fast can the R5 read out its sensor? Uh, again, as I said, I'm very much focusing to this whole discussion totally, you know, from a a camera hardware perspective on the R5, but not necessarily like this. Certainly, could be implemented by anybody on anything, potentially. Well, one way that we can look at the R5's readout speed is to look at how it does or performs in video mode, what it's doing, how fast it's reading things out. And the there are some twists and turns to this because obviously different resolutions are going to have different limitations, but uh, if we look at, for example, uh, 4K at 120 frames per second, shooting with a 125th shutter speed, that the average time or the, 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 the frame time, so how long frame lasts, ends up being 8.3 milliseconds. And a 120th, 125th of a second is about 8 milliseconds. And that leaves us about 300 microseconds to take available for the camera to read out the sensor. Um, now, does it take all of that? Who knows? But that gives us one number to look at. Another number is if we look at uh, 4K 60, so shooting at 60 frames a second uh, with a 60th of a second shutter speed, we have a frame time of about 16.683 uh, milliseconds because uh, NTSC 60 frames a second is actually 119.88 frames a second. It's 60,000 divided by 1,001. Uh, so it's actually a big long fraction, but whatever. And a 60th of a second shutter speed gives us an exposure time of 16.666 repeating milliseconds. And that actually leaves us only about 16 microseconds per uh, of spare time, essentially. Now, you know, the, well, let me just go through the last set of numbers I have here, which is shooting at 8K 30 at a 30th of a second. So again, NTSC 30 frames per second is actually 29.97 frames a second, which works out to a, a frame time, uh, you know, an inner, you know, time between frames or total frame length or whatever, however you want to put it of, 33.367 milliseconds and a 30th of a second is 33.3 repeating milliseconds and that gives us about 34 microseconds. So what I'm, I think this is telling us is the camera can read the sensor out really quick, uh, at least on the order of a few tens of microseconds. And even if you're talking about a rolling shutter, the, well, first of all, the rolling shutter on the camera is very quick. Um, and we know this because if you do the sort of industry standard rolling shutter test of whip panning back and forth, there, there's very little uh, jello uh, or lean to vertical lines when doing that with the R5. And that would be uh, representative of a very fast rolling shutter readout. So the camera can read the lines and move very quickly across the system. So I think it's reasonable to say that the camera sensors in the R5 at least, but probably pretty much anything in a really good modern camera, is capable of reading out in a 10 or a few tens of microseconds. Now, 
reading out to what more than likely it's some kind of on chip buffer because well the that's there's limitations in how fast things can get moved around and in fact as an aside i don't think people give enough credit to the complexity, difficulty, and impressiveness of just how much data gets shuffled around in a modern digital camera. So if you consider, for instance, on the R5, shooting 8K video at 10 bits per frame, the sensor is reading out 35.3 million pixels times 10 bits times 30 frames a second, and that works out to like 1.33 gigabytes a second. Uh, except if you didn't have some kind of buffering going on on the chip, which that doesn't sound all that crazy. In fact, that really isn't all that crazy. But if you don't have some kind of buffering going on on the chip and you actually tried to transfer that so that each frame was moved in the, let's just say, 30 microseconds that you have between the full length uh, or a, a 360 degree shutter exp uh, or, um, shutter exposure time and the frame sack time, you're talking about having to move um, million, like 1.1 trillion pixels a second, which works out to something like 1.47 terabytes a second in average bandwidth. Now, you're not using that average bandwidth or the camera wouldn't be using that average bandwidth continuously. It would be sending these little tiny bursts of a ton of data, but there has to be some something going on buffering uh, sort of between the sensor and the chip because that is a massive amount of uh, bandwidth to, to deal with. Okay, so we have some ideas about how much of an, you know, uh, or how fast the sensor can read out. So the next sort of obvious question to ask is, well, how fast does this readout thing translate if we were translating it into something moving across the frame in pixels per, you know, with our move or pixel movement criteria? And, you know, this is, I'm not going to dive tremendously into the trigonometry. Well, it's actually not even that complicated of math. It's uh, time and the percentage of the frame and some angles and you, you work things out. But basically it comes down to uh, if, if we have a 10, sec a 10 microsecond integration time, which is probably, on, or a 10 microsecond capture, collection, readout, whatever you want to call it. I think readout's a good word there. Uh, readout time. How fast does something have to move to skip a pixel? Uh, and it works out to be, it has to move across the width of the frame in about 82 milliseconds, which is like ridiculously fast. Um, am I doing that right? Hoping I've got the math here right. Uh, Yeah, okay. But yeah, so it would have to, and this is regardless of lens. So if you have a longer lens, the thing has to move faster in space, but in, in terms of crossing the frame, it's still covering the same frame width in amount of time. If we went to uh, a 30, uh, or well, if we went to a three frame width or three pixel gap, like we were okay with the, the gap, then the thing would have to be going across the frame at about 27 milliseconds, which these are like ridiculous numbers. So let's like not even consider that. Let's just say 500 milliseconds. And we come up with crossing the frame for a one pixel gap. It would take four seconds to get across or it would cross. Yeah, four seconds to get across. And Crossing the frame with a three second gap would take about 1.3 seconds to get, so about a third of, uh, of the, the 
Now I'm thinking my math screwed up here for some reason. Hang on just a second and let me just look at this. Because I know I'm doing something. Number doesn't just seem right. And I did, okay, so I did all almost all of this math that I'm, I'm looking at here uh, over a week ago. And I'm totally not... Uh, I'm, I'm totally, well, what do I try to say, like having to remember some of the math because I, I have notes that I'm working on, but I didn't make super awesome notes on everything. Um... And this is, unfortunately, I'm going to just skip past a little bit of this. This is, I had this, like I said, I had originally planned to do this in, in one live stream and I had gone through and I had all of this straight in my head. And I just spent an hour going through the rest of the, or my notes before I did this so that I could, you know, I understood what was going on. And now for whatever reason, things are just not looking right to me. So uh, my apologies. Uh, Long story short, things have to hustle to get across the frame when we're talking microsecond or tens of microseconds or even half a millisecond readout times. So it's generally going to be pretty useful. Um, however, one interesting thing is a, a rolling shutter kind of continuous readout actually kind of works in our favor here. If you can constantly read out the sensor, you because we're averaging it you don't get this the the leaning pixel effect you get just an average and yeah it's maybe not quite as well it, we're averaging so it's it's not that big of a deal uh it just gives you sort of a constant stream of data to work on as opposed to uh bursty chunky data so Long story short, it is certainly possible, I think, to deal with the artifacting of multiple frames with the kinds of readout time that is available in modern sensors. I should also add, I went and looked at data sheets for non-canon, like sensors made by analog devices that are available publicly. And I'm coming up, these sensors are, I'm coming up with readout times that are very much in the same vein as what I'm talking about here. So it's not, uh, you know, tens of microseconds or several tens of microseconds or even low hundreds of microseconds is not unreasonable, an unreasonable estimate. Okay, so let's move on to the second problem, which is that we have a hard real-time processing requirement here. Things have to get done in a certain amount of time. The Essentially, whatever we're doing to do our averaging has to be done before the next frame has to be read and with enough room for the camera to be able to do whatever other, whatever other work the camera has to do between frames or during frames for housekeeping tasks or Essentially what happens is you end up building up a buffer of frames and that artificially or su substantially limits what you can do with this. So you're basically back to the idea of, well, how much buffer memory do you have? Save frames into that and then do something after the fact. So computationally, the, uh, there has, this has to be done efficiently. Which brings us to how do you do this? What, what kind of algorithm do you use? And there's essentially two choices that can be made here. So one choice is to do a, uh, a running average. Um, goes by a lot of different names, but we're gonna just call it a running average. And this is a, an algorithm or a, a process where you are constantly uh, 
integrating to a, a new average every step. So instead of the traditional arithmetic mean where you store up the sum of everything that you've done and dividing it by however many things frames you took, you're, it's a, a more complicated algorithm, but it, it, it's potentially has advan well it potentially it has some advantages but it potentially has some real drawbacks so uh, a running average uh, let me just throw my notes over here and flip back to the monitor so a running average is uh, a running average is given by this equation here uh, so the average of the next frame is equal to the average that we've currently stored plus the new frame coming in minus the current average divided by the number of frames plus one. And the advantage of a running average like this is that, well, honestly, the math looks easy. Like it, the math doesn't look like it should be that big of a difference or, or that big of a consideration. The big advantage is that it has the potential benefit of not needing to have a larger buffer or store things um, in multiple buffers or store multiple frames or anything like that, which means that the process could be run uh, essentially indefinitely. You are just constantly churning over the same chunk of memory. The downside to this process is that for every pixel in the frame, well, the, there's two computational parts to this. So for every frame, you have to increment your frame counter, so the, the n plus 1 in that equation. And for every pixel, you have to do an addition, a subtraction, and a division. And the killer here is the division. Divisions are incredibly slow, especially if there isn't hardware to do the division. And unfortunately, this is one of those things that when you start talking about digital signal processors, which are really good at doing this kind of pixel manipulation stuff, they don't tend to have hardware division capabilities. Uh, they can divide by powers of two because that's a bit shift and that's easy, but arbitrary divisions tend to be very slow compared to addition, subtraction, and multiplication. And uh, just to put some perspective on this, in the ARM V4 or the ARM M4 architecture, uh, it's the, the sort of low power ARM architecture, a addition, subtraction, and I believe multiplication is expected to take or has a, a, a oper uh, a latency, I guess, is the right word for this, of one cycle. It takes one clock cycle of the chip to do that operation. A division takes at least two, and in the worst case, it can take as many as 12. So given the, the al running al average, the we end up with, for a 45 megapixel frame, somewhere on the order of 134,300,000 and change individual operations, not including loads and stores, just the mathematic operations that need to be done per frame. Now, if that could be done fast enough, the advantage here is for, again, an R5 size frame, we need a single 16-bit or 12-bit, 12 to 16-bit, depending on, you know, again, whether it's 12-bit ADCs or 16-bit ADCs or, or what's most efficient in the processor, which probably could be six, maybe 16 bits. Unsigned integer buffer for the average, and then we need the buffer for the image data, which is another 45 megapixel, 12 to 14-bit buffer. And all told, the whole process needs between 135 and 160-ish meg of RAM. And the whole process basically runs indefinitely. There is no limit 
essentially to the number of frames or the number of record amount of recording time that can be done with this as long as the math can be done fast enough and the camera doesn't overheat and the battery doesn't run out it can just keep going so the alternative option is a standard arithmetic mean uh, Sum up all the values and divide it by the number of values that are there, that you number of frames that you had. Uh, so this has some other things going on. For example, well, primarily this requires that we have storage in the camera for a accumulator of some sort that we can add uh, an accumulator frame that we can add each individual pixel values, you know, subsequently frame by frame. Now, I don't know the ins and outs, obviously, because I don't work for Canon of what their architecture supports, uh, but throwing some numbers out. So in the EOS R5, the output from the sensor is 12-bit when using a fully electronic shutter, which is the essentially the fastest inner frame spacing and what's being done when you're shooting video. And it's 13 or 14 bits otherwise, depending on um, whether you're in continuous high plus or not. So if we could have, or we have a 32-bit a unsigned accumulator frame, um, I'm going to say frame, but essentially we're talking about a place in memory where each pixel can be summed up and stored available. We can figure out how many frames the camera could store before it filled up that buffer space or that accumulator space. For a, assuming 12 bits, because again, I'm talking in the context of the R5, and so I'm talking about uh, implementation essentially in existing hardware and because to get the lowest inner frame gap we need to shoot in essentially fully electronic shutter mode or which is what video is but either way we're talking about 12 bits so we can figure out that um, essentially you have 2 to the 32 minus 1 is the maximum value that you can store in an unsigned 32-bit integer. And our each of our individual frames, the largest possible value that that frame from the sensor can contain would be 2 to the 12 minus 1. And dividing those by each other, we come up with 1,048,832 frames is what you could store in if you were simply adding 12-bit uh, frame or pixel values into a 32-bit uh, accumulator. For 14 bits, which now this wouldn't apply, necessarily apply to the R5, but would apply to potentially a, a future camera or maybe somebody else's camera or whatever that could do this in 14 bits. For 14 bits, we're talking about 262,160 frames that you could uh, add into the accumulator before you overflowed a 32-bit value. So, what does this mean? Like, that's a lot of frames, but what does this mean? And is this good enough in terms of using this to simulate neutral density? Well, using the 1,048,000 and change number and multiplying that by a 30th of a second, we get basically nine hours, 42 minutes, and 41 seconds of that's how long the camera can be exposed and recording before it overflows the buffer and you'd have to do something else. Um, for the 262,000 in change number, we get two hours, 25 minutes, and 38 seconds. Uh, in either case, I would say both of these numbers are perfectly feasible for a long exposure type thing. And given the amount of exposure time we're talking about, even if you only could shoot for two hours and 25 minutes, if you then shoot for another two hours and 25 minutes and average those two in post or whatever, so you're essentially shooting for four hours and 50 minutes, that 
you've dramatically reduced the amount of data that you have to bring home and deal with. You know, compared to if you wanted to shoot for two hours and 25 minutes at a 30th of a second, you know, you'd need 262,000 odd pictures to get there that, in you know, which would be like a huge amount of images that you would need to take and a tremendous amount of wear on the shutter. I mean, unless you're shooting in the electronic shutter mode, which, okay, that actually isn't that bad, uh, but a tremendous amount of data that you would have to deal with. So looking at the computation, moving to look at the computational requirements, this is where the averaging process essentially, I think, has the advantage here. So in real time, what you have, what has to be done in real time as the camera is recording, every frame you have a single addition operation incrementing the number of frames that you've taken counter. And for every pixel, you have a single addition adding the new pixel value to the accumulator that you're storing everything in, you're, you're storing that running total in. Uh, as you go along. And that works out to, again, for an EOS R5 sized frame, 44,761,089 operations per frame, which is dramatically less than the 134 million operations that the previous th the cumulative running average, uh, or the running average took. And it's a fast operation. It's a simple addition. And you'll see how fast this actually can be. Now, of course, this process has an after imaging requirement where you have to divide every value in that buffer by the number of image operations or, or the number of frames that you're averaging, that you essentially took, that you're averaging over, uh, which is, again, 44 million and change operations. However, this is no longer a real-time operation. This is something that takes time to, uh, you know, you can sit there and let it process. And it, if it takes a few seconds, it's not really that big a deal. Um, and I think I'm going to come back to that. Uh, let me just look real quick. Uh, no, I don't see it in my notes, so I'll talk about it right now. Uh, in the process of looking at this, I went and looked at what a ARM processor is capable of. So a uh, like 500 megahertz Cortex M4 ARM processor, it's a low power, it's I'm not sure if that's the architecture that Canon uses as the sort of system level processor in the Digic processor, but um, it's something that's certainly slower than what's in a computer or in a, a smartphone type thing. And using their numbers for division operations, I figured out, uh, I figure, or I'm estimating that it would take um, somewhere around a second or something like that to do the division for 45 megapixels worth of information. So you'd be, you'd be, you're talking about basically a, a one second processing time, maybe two, after the picture is taken, while the camera does the computations to then dump that out to a file. Now, where this doesn't work quite as well compared to the um, cumulative running averages and memory requirements, but even then, we're not talking about something that's kind of ridiculous. So we need a 32-bit by 45 megapixel buffer for storing the image data, and that works out to about 180 or 179, 170, well, it's 100, roughly 179 million bytes. Uh, I should just say megabytes and not the S or the SI unit. Uh, and then, of course, we need a buffer for the image data, which is 12 
bits or maybe 16 bits or whatever, which is again, somewhere around 60 to 70 something, uh, 72 bytes, whatever, uh, 60 to 80 or 60 to 90 megabytes for the image, uh, depending on whether it's 12 bits or 16 bit buffer, but you know, whatever works, uh, you know, whatever the camera has to use, which gives us a total of about 238 uh, 240 megabytes of storage needed for a 45 megapixel image with the 32 bit accumulator to uh, sum everything up. Now, what the advantage, as I said, of this really is, is it shifts that really computationally challenged or computationally slow division out of the hard real time time component and puts it into the uh, we don't care anymore because the image is done and we're just waiting for it to, to process and save to a disk or save to a card. And that process and save to a card probably shouldn't be uh, that that long, you know, even for a processor that's not tremendously fantastic. Like we're not talking about uh, 50 minutes to calculate this. We're talking about something that should be in the seconds range. Okay, so talking about this in theory is great and all, but I really wanted to have some hard numbers to see, like, is this something that is feasible or possible or could this be done? Like, you know, I'm... I'm talking about like, well, you know, 30th of a second and this and that and the next thing. But like, that doesn't mean a hill of beans if the, like throwing the problem, doing the math actually ends up being something that's so computationally intensive. It requires a, you know, GeForce RTX 3090 or four or something in parallel to get it done in that kind of time frame. So I sat down, dusted off my C++ skills, uh, which are really dusty and not very good, and I threw together some test code that I've run on a uh, E3 Xeon uh, 1270 V6 processor running at a maximum of 4.2 gigahertz. Now, the first thing before I even dive into showing this stuff is there's obviously a question here. If I'm running this on a Xeon on a desktop, you know, or a server in this case, computer, does this have any bearing for a digic processor or something that can be run in the camera? And the answer to that is maybe. So on one hand, a, a desktop processor is hamstrung in that it's a general purpose tool. It's a general purpose processor. It's not optimized to do image manipulation or the kind of extremely wide parallel operations that our image manipulation is essentially made up of. And so it may be more powerful in the sense that it can use more power or it can, uh, you know, run at a much higher clock speed, but on the same token, it's not necessarily designed to be as efficient at image type operations. And so the flip side of that is cameras have processors that are designed in them to do image manipulation and to do image manipulation quickly and efficiently and power efficiently and so on and so forth. Now, unfortunately, we we end up talking about th there's a level of I don't know here because I don't work for Canon and I don't know what the processing capabilities are in a, a Canon processor, in a Digic processor. I mean, we know, for example, that the JPEG or um, high efficiency image, you know, the, either of those compressed formats are probably being done with specialized, dedicated, special purpose hardware. However, like applying picture styles and we can tune the picture styles and we can attune, uh, we can tune color balance and color balance is a mathematical operation. It's a, it's not something that's just 
you know, not happening arbitrarily or something. It's, it's a, there's, all of this is processing that has to be done. So, uh, clarity, um, color balance, you know, white balance tweaking, the, the picture style, saturation, desaturation. Now, there's a lot of this that probably could be, ha you know, probably could have specialized hardware put into the JPEG processing to handle, uh, or it may be being done just with essentially DSPs that are good for image manipulation and have essentially the you know hardware that's available for oper you know the op types of operations the multiplications etc that uh, are available. So I wanted to kind of get an idea of you know how maybe this all works out. And so I started digging around through the white papers for digital signal processors. I wanted to see what was out there, you know, what kinds of processing or whatever. And uh, I ended up just pulling a random data sheet for a Texas Instruments TMS 30, uh, 320C6421, which isn't an imaging specific DSP. It's just a, it, it's a DSP. The top ends ones run at uh, 700 megahertz and uh, they have uh, six ALUs. They can do 116-bit or 132-bit or 216-bit arithmetic operations per clock. And they can do about 4,200 uh, million or 4.2 billion instructions per second through the ALU, through all six of them uh, averaged together. So taking an average of about 135 million instructions per second, uh, ignoring latency for loads and stores, but this includes the instructions for loading and storing, which don't actually get done in the ALU I, on these DSPs. They get done in the memory controller unit or whatever. Uh, but just throwing some numbers that are kind of ballparky and reasonable, uh, we come up with around a theoretical limit of our performance of around 31 frames a second for a uh, this specific Texas Instruments uh, ALU. So this is our DSP. So this isn't intended to be indicative of the performance of a Digic A or Digic X processor, but I, which I'd actually maybe expect to be a little faster than a general purpose ALU how, or um, DSP. However, uh, it's indicative of sort of the capabilities that you could expect from hardware that's designed to process images optimally. So let's jump back to the desktop. And I hope this is coming through clear. Uh, maybe I just make it a little bit bigger. Uh, so I wrote some test code, and I'm actually going to, yeah, we'll just do eight iterations. Uh, I wrote some test code, and the, the test code has uh, six operation, uh, six approaches that I, I've put together uh, for processing. Uh, a scalar running average, a threaded, which is... Uh, single cord or single processored. So just one processor that this is a, as I said, this is a, a Xeon E3 1270 V6. So it's four cores, eight threads. And so the, a scalar, which is not doing anything parallel, it's just one operation in sequence through the process, uh, running average, a threaded scalar running average so it was using all eight thread or all eight thread capabilities of the CPU um, a scalar mean which again is just se sequentially doing each mathematical operation one at a time for each pixel and then moving on to the next pixel a, a vectorized using the AVX2 instruction set on the the Xeon processor a vectorized cumulative or running average, a vectorized mean where each, uh, for each clock or each loop 
of the addition of moving through the thing, I'm processing four pixels, I believe it is, uh, because this is actually SSE code, not AVX code, and so it's only 128 bits, not, uh, uh, but anyway. Uh, I'm processing four pixels instead of one, which this is starting to get a little bit more indicative of what you would get from a DS, you know, a system for in a camera that's using uh, DSPs or wide, uh, you know, uh, simmed single instruction, multiple data type operations. Uh, I took that. Uh, I, I did another, uh, just a straight vectorized mean, like I said, and then I did the vectorized mean and I threaded it. So it was the, the, um, the additions were spread out. So it was each CPU core was doing four pixels simultaneously. And then each, uh, or each thread was doing four pixels simultaneously. And then the whole thing was running on the, uh, all eight threads simultaneously. So I had essentially um, 48, I think if I'm doing the math right, 32, yeah, no, 48, 48 pixels being processed simultaneously. Uh, the reason I went kind of all over the place with this, aside from just the, the fact that I don't get to write C++ very often and I've never worked with Intel uh, simmed intrinsics before, is uh, and so that was kind of fun and i got really sidetracked and playing with that is looking at the different possible operations or options that were or that are you know could be happening in a camera so for example the threaded uh vector operation the the threaded vector mean would be indicative of maybe what we, you would actually have in a camera with specialized hardware. Uh, you know, obviously it's not going to be as power efficient being done in a generic processor or a general purpose processor, but would be indicative of the kind of processing throughput that could happen in a, a optimized image processor that's capable of operating on you know, many pixels simultaneously. Um, so I have a number of different options here. Um, I, I, again, kind of went overboard on the, the processing capabilities or on the, the testing. So I started throwing all kinds of things at it, like uh, how long would it take? You know, what's, what would be the processing time and memory usage? And that's the other thing here. Um, I hope you can see this. So I've broken it out. Uh, total time is the total amount of time it took to run the test. So for eight iterations on the phase one uh, IQ or yeah, IQ4, 150 megapixel sized file, uh, eight iterations took um, 2.4 seconds to do everything in total. Each frame took 300 milliseconds to process. Uh, so that's the frame time is telling me the, the time it took for each, uh, each individual frame. So if that was, uh, in the, the running average, that was for the addition, subtraction and division in an, in the just simple arithmetic mean that was just for the addition that has to happen during each frame. Uh, the division time, which is basically the post-processing time is the time it took for the processor to do all of the divisions needed for dividing out the, 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 the means, the, 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 those files. Um, that was not tremendously optimized, but then again, my approach feeling here is something to the effect that it's not, um, it's not time critical. Optimized is great, but getting it done is more important. And since this is test code and it's not indicative necessarily of what the camera would do, it's to give me an idea about actual times. Um, you know, yeah, it is what it is. Um, the average size, buffer size, and total memory in the, the last three columns, uh, the average size is the buffer that I'm using to average things into. The 
uh, buffer size is the buffer for each frame, how much data that's taking up, and the memory is total memory in megabytes is how much memory the combination of those two would use again in megabytes. So, you know, for a Canon R5 image doing well, a pair of 32 bit buffers. Uh, I should also point out that the reason the vector files are all 32 bits is it's very easy in SSE to add 32 bit numbers together. You have to do more instructions and more processing to split out 16 bit numbers, add them, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, so just having bit parity is, uh, you know, equal sized bits uh, or equal sized uh, variables is is efficient and from a processing standpoint in this architecture. So anyway, like I said, for a, a, a pair of 16 bits buffers doing the running average, the camera needs 180 meg, 179 meg. For a pair of 32 bit buffers, it needs 358 meg. Um, average, you know, again, like I said, and I'll, I'll, I think I'll see about putting the code, uh, putting the code and putting this table, uh, or at least putting the code up. I don't know. Um, putting the table up something I'll, I'll look into something about getting a, a better, uh, a better number out there. But, uh, so like I said, uh, I did this for 150 megapixels for like a phase one camera, just to see how this works out. Cause the problem here is, is the more pixels you have, the bigger the picture is, the more you have to just, the more data has to be processed. Uh, I threw in an 80 megapixel file for the hypothetical people, one of the resolutions that people have, or that Canon Rumors, for example, or the rumor mill, I should say, has been talking about for the hypothetical EOS R5S is a 80 megapixel camera. Uh, I did the A7R4, which is, I think, 60 megapixels, if I remember correctly. The R5, which is 44.7 megapixels. Uh, and then I decided while I was doing this, I wanted to do some video stuff. Well, and I also did the R6 and 1DX, so the 20 megapixels, I think that is, if I'm remembering the number correctly. Uh, but I also did some video stuff, so DCI 8K, DCI 4K, and 1080p. Uh, because when I started playing with the numbers, one of the things that I realized is some things can get done really fast. If there isn't a lot of data, there is actually, like, potentially time to do things, like, things can get very quick. Like, the threaded vector mean for 1080p, it takes four, 500 microseconds on, again, my computer, but this is not far off from the kind of performance I might expect from a integer optimized uh, DSP that you might have available in a camera. So in a lot of cases, I mean, even going up to the R5, most things and so here's, well, here's two takeaways. So first takeaway is, is the scalar, you know, not threaded, not parallelized, nothing. Uh, moving average is uh, slow, which, you know, we should expect. It's not very efficient to not, you know, it's an easily parallelized, parallelizable process at, for dealing with pictures. And it's slow if you're not parallelizing it. However, Threading it speeds it up to where it's roughly... Now, now, again, this is on a computer with a dedicated hardware divider, so it's not necessarily what would be possible on a camera. But threading it speeds it up pretty much in par, on par with the mean, the vector, and all of the vector operations. And there's an interesting takeaway to make here, which is that we may not actually be running into the limits of, with the exception of the unthreaded scalar moving average, we may not actually be seeing the limits of computational power here, but 
the actual limits of memory bandwidth. Because one thing I noticed is that once I parallelized things, once I either threaded the non, you know, the scalar stuff or for basically all of the vector stuff, where I'm dealing with more than one essentially pixel worth of information at a time, all the times are very similar. They're around for a, a 45 megapixel image, they're around 20 milliseconds. And so the interesting thing that I discovered or noticed when I was doing this is my server is dual channel memory. It gives has about 42 gigabytes a second worth of bandwidth. Uh, 42.6, I think it is. It's DDR4, 266 memory. It's ECC, etc. blah, blah, blah. And if you take 20, 20 milliseconds and you multiply that by 42.6 gigabytes a second, you get 852 megabytes a second per transfer. And for example, in the, uh, in all of these, there's, two or three memory operations happening per mathematical process. There is some reads and a write. Uh, reading essentially, well, there's two reads and a write. So you're reading the buffer, you're reading the average, and you're writing back to the average, regardless of what you're doing. And that is right about at the theoretical limits of what the computer or the, the, the practical limits of what the available memory bandwidth in the computer can deal with. And so, you know, this does, I think, first of all, this put a big perspective for me on just how much memory bandwidth is possibly available in a camera. I'm literally maxing out a desktop server processor, and I'm pretty sure that if I had to do more math, I could do more math on these operations on my server than I have on, uh, you know, than I, I'm doing here. And it would be just as fast because I'm pretty sure I'm at the, the limits of memory. The, the memory just can't read move data any faster. And we're going to talk about this with respect to, for example, the R5. Um, of course, ads are cheap. Uh, you know, divides in this case are, well, it's a, um, a desktop processor. It has hardware division. And this is probably one of those places where it's not necessarily indicative of what a mobile part, you know, a, a DSP could do. Most DSP cores don't have the hardware, arbitrary hardware division, uh, and so that would be something that I would expect to either be incredibly slow or, you know, basically to the point of not being functionally possible for this. Uh, obviously, the uh, image processing is super, super parallelizable. I mean, every pixel, for this kind of thing, every pixel is completely independent of every other pixel. And so there is absolutely no, you know, if you have more threads, more processing cores, more parallel instructions, it just, you know, hog wild goes at it. Uh, that said, even though the computer has uh, the ability to do arbitrary division without software emulation, you notice that it still takes a while. So for the the uh, EOS R5, the arbitrary division, even for non or for a scalar mean, not threaded, it just additions, you know, the, 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 the real-time component was just additions, uh, one after another for 45 million pixels. The division still took uh, 70 milliseconds. Uh, so that's a, a pretty big, and you you can see like 88 milliseconds to do the cumulative moving average or the cumul the, the the running average. Uh, 70 milliseconds of that total time was spent doing divisions. The rest was the additions, which is I mean like even on a computer that has all of this kind of processing power, that still was slow to do divides. Okay, so.
going back to, and I said earlier, how does this compare to something? Uh, how does this compare to a, a DSP, a image processing chip, that kind of thing? Well, the KB Lake Xeon that I'm using, each thread or each core has four integer adders available for so four integer ALUs, uh, which is actually half as many are available in that TI DSP that I talked about. Now I'm running, these are running at a basically four times the clock speed. Uh, and you would think, okay, well, four, that's great. However, in practice, this not super efficiently tuned hand optimized code, which this is the kind of thing that could very easily be hand optimized because it's small code path. It's a minimal amount of, uh, you know, code that needs to be written for the processing stuff. Uh, but in terms of real world operations, I did a bunch of digging and it looks like this processor only really gets about 2.3 integer ads per cycle. So it doesn't get the four. So it's basically 28% of the potential throughput of that DSP core at four times the clock. You know, 28% per clock at four times the clock, which means that that DSP core should be able to do this, assuming well-optimized code, at basically the same amount of time, basically the same performance level, um, which is, you know, pretty impressive when you consider that that was a 700 megahertz part and not optimized or designed for image processing, where an image processing one may have even more parallel capabilities. So the questions, this definitely raises questions. Can a Digic X processor do this? Uh, do this or, and do this as well? Um, don't know. Uh, but I guess that's what it really comes down to is uh, I don't work for Canon. I don't have access to their documentation. I don't have the ability to dig into the uh, ins and outs of the processor in the camera and the capabilities. So it's probably pretty reasonable to assume that the camera is not running at 4.2 gigahertz. Uh, so it's gonna be lower clocked, but on the same token, it's also a camera and there's a lot of funk specifically tailored, hard the hardware is all specifically tailored for that process, for the needs of a camera. So, where it makes up with not doing as many instructions per second in terms of like clock speed, it could very easily counter that in the other direction by doing a whole lot in parallel because it's going to be the same instructions done on many pixels. And this is very typical of image processing. Uh, it also, I think this also should so I talked two weeks ago about the idea of opening up cameras as an app ecosystem and the concerns that I had about this and that, uh, you know, we're not talking, when you're talking about a 40 megapixel or 45 megapixel camera shooting at 20 frames a second or shooting 8K video, you know, we're not talking about the 12 megapixel camera in an iPhone with a little bit of special hardware and an awful lot of processor that's really not you know there's still the same hardware thing going on in a camera we're talking about really tightly integrated systems and i think this is where i come back to the uh you know my concern being that this just shows how tightly integrated everything in a camera has to be to perform and not fall apart so um, let's shift over to talk about image sensors and stuff for a second. So obviously Canon doesn't, you know, because I hinted at this earlier, uh, obviously Canon doesn't publish the uh, performance capabilities interface data. Their sensors are proprietary. They're used for their own cameras. The only sensors that they, they publish information on are their... Uh, um, 
the handful that they sell commercially. So for example, the uh, 120, uh, the 120 MXS, which is, you know, a Canon commercial image sensor. It's their 120 megapixel sensor that can do 10 frames a second, I believe it is, or something like that. And in the white paper for that and the details for that, they talk about how the, the interface to it. And the interface to that sensor, and the reason I'm talking about this is talking about, we talked about getting data off the sensor into the camera, uh, into the main, main memory and processing. Uh, so on that sensor, they have uh, 28 lanes at running at 100 or 720 megabits per second. Uh, so that's uh, basically, it's amazing. I didn't actually write down a total there, but that's a pretty good chunk of information. Uh, you know, cape transfer capabilities. Each line on the image from that sensor is 13,272 uh, 13, pixels long at 10 bits per pixel, uh, running at that 28, the, uh, 28 uh, that 720 megabit lane. Uh, it would take approximately uh, 6.58 microseconds to transfer that from the sensor to the, the whatever's using it, the main processor. And then, of course, there's uh, 9,176 lines times 6.58 microseconds per line gives us about 60 milliseconds per frame for, uh, you know, completely reading out that sensor. So, you know, the question is, is how does something like the sensor in the R5 compare? Uh, you know, we're talking bandwidth and, you know, the thing is, is like you have a lot of bandwidth and you don't move things quickly or do you have, you know, a buffer in the chip to handle things or whatever. And I don't really know. Uh, obviously, like I said, it's proprietary information inside Canon. So if we assume, though, that the, we're using it's something similar to that 28 by 720 megabit thing, then we should see about 5.6 microseconds to transfer each line of, of R5's image. And we should see about 30 milliseconds total to transfer the entire uh entire frame, entire size. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not even sure where I was going with that. I'm just going by my notes. Uh, the, the, oh, okay. So there's a good chance to believe, I think, that the readout may be even faster than that. Because if we do the same math, assuming 12 bits per pixel, which is the uh, bit rate for uh, the electronic shutter, and the ADCs are happening on chip, as far as I can tell, then we would need 20 milliseconds to transfer everything off the chip and shoot, and I'm, I'm doing this for... Uh, 8K video, essentially, and to shoot at 30 frames per second with a 60th shutter speed, the there's only 16.67 uh, milliseconds available before the next frame starts. So either the chip has to have a buffer or it has to be transferring faster than that, which again goes back to the, the whole thing about memory bandwidth and moving things around and... Um, I guess in some ways this was a tangent that was kind of just there because I was digging into it and not necessarily entirely relevant. So let's talk about for a second about memory bandwidth on a camera specifically like the EOS R5. So I dug around, I found a picture of the motherboard from DIYphotography.net and there's a, what appears to be four memory modules surrounding the digital, uh, the Digix processor. Uh, one model or one of the chips has is identifiable as an SK Hynix module with a, the part number H9HCNNNBKUMLHR-NME. Uh, 
Couldn't find any information on that directly. However, Micron, who else makes memory modules and makes the other was had the other made the other three modules on that uh, particular board. Uh, they have a cross reference tool, and that will tell you you put in a competitor's part and it will tell you what their part is. And I got a little bit more information through that. I also did find a, a sales sheet from Hynix that you know, kind of talked about this. Um, but essentially, each of those four modules, as best I can tell, appear to be 16 gigabyte, gigabit, which makes them two gigabytes per uh, um, each, uh, 3,733 megabit per second transfer uh, low power DDR4X memory modules. And they're organized as 512 million uh, bits by 32 uh, lanes, essentially, in parallel. Uh, running at a clock to get that thir uh, 3733 uh, bits, it's running at a clock of 1866 megahertz. Uh, so DDR transfers two bits per cycle. Um, so that's where that all comes from, if you're not familiar with it from like PC stuff. So this is, this is some pretty impressive memory. Um, if, if my assumption is correct that each of those four modules is independently linked to the CPU, that gives it 128-bit memory bus. Now, again, which seems reasonable to me, because, again, we talked that the biggest problem or one of the biggest hurdles for a camera like the R5 or really any modern high-resolution, high-frame rate camera is bandwidth. It's moving the data around fast enough. And so assuming that those those chips are in parallel and not say two bits, two pieces in series or two two runs in series, but are being run in parallel, so 128 bit wide bus, um, that works out to about 60 gigabytes a second of memory transfer, which compared to my test server that I ran the sample test code on, is about 40% more memory bandwidth than I have. Uh, it's pretty, uh, it seems pretty obvious that there's eight gigabytes of memory available on the camera. So the hundred, couple hundred meg that's necessary is um, not, uh, what do I want to say, not unreasonable or, or not, doesn't completely, that, Okay, Jason, you're getting tired. You're almost done. Get through this. Uh, 8 gig doesn't seem unreasonable. However, I'm not sure if it's all available for buffering images. Uh, so I did some quick sanity checks on this, and with a shooting raw with a 95, a 90 megasecond write or 95 megasecond write flash card, uh, running my camera until I, you know, the buffer was filled. Uh, I came up with something, oh, no, I take that back. Using Canon published numbers, I came up with about 4.3, 4 gigabytes of data being stored, you know, in the buffer. Uh, doing it with Canon's published numbers for the, the C-RAW data, I came up with about 6.85 gigabytes of data being stored in the buffer. So that's, again, data created minus, uh, again, using a UHS-1 card at 90 megasecond or 95 megasecond. Uh, that's the amount of data coming off the sensor at 12 frames a second, 14 bit, minus the amount of data that the card could write in the entire time that the, the buffer was running. Uh, so, and of course, the, the final sort of data point there, and I think this is ultimately, and, I, and I've said this in other videos, why the camera probably has 8 gig of RAM and why I'm pretty sure it's got 8 gig of RAM in it is you can do 8K all uh, or IPB compression and IPB compression for video. Uh, all, the reason, you know, I talked about this in a video previously about the, the um, 5D Mark IV and why the 5D Mark IV uses motion JPEG for 4K and not H.264. And it has to do with how much buffer memory is available in the camera. And 
using Motion JPEG, Canon could leverage the JPEG hardware to compress the frames and not use the limited amount of buffer memory or memory that's available in the camera. But for a camera like the R5 that's doing IPB compression, and so looking at compression algorithms, just slight detour, looking at compression algorithms, if uh, Motion JPEG, in a device that has hardware JPEG compression, Motion JPEG is the fastest or the least memory intensive. It, you stream the data through the JPEG compressor, you get the data back out as a compressed JPEG and you write it to the card. Next up in terms of memory use is H.264 doing all eye compression because it doesn't have to save each subsequent frame. Uh, next to that would be H.265 doing all eye compression because again, it doesn't, it only has to have one frame at a time in memory. The most memory intensive operations are going to be for uh, IPB compression, because what IPB compression is, is you have iframes that are standalone frames, you have predictive frames that reference a standalone frame or a predictive frame and are a difference, and then you have bi-predictive frames that reference multiple standalone frames or multiple P frames, I or P frames, and for the, this to be calculated, the camera has to have all of that group of pictures or GOP in memory to be able to deal with it. And so as frame sizes get larger, the amount of memory goes up. So 1080p, you can get done in under 500 meg doing all I, or IPB compression. When you go to 4K, you jump up to needing something around a gig at least, um, maybe even two. Uh, I don't have notes for that probably right in front of me, but uh, people would be surprised at how much memory, for example, is in a GoPro Hero 5. There's actually more memory in a GoPro Hero 5 than there is in a Canon 5D Mark IV. When you get to 8K and you're dealing with 30 megapixels, and especially if you're dealing with 10-bit compression or 10-bit um, color or data, uh, you start talking about needing a lot of memory. Uh, I did some tests using FFmpeg on Linux just to see what compressing an 8K file looked like or 8K data. Uh, again, it's software and I was recompressing a file, so it's not quite the same thing, but I ended up running over 10 gig just to recompress an 8K file in H.264 using, as I said, FFmpeg. So the there's both a lot of memory in the camera and there is a lot of, probably a lot of bandwidth. Uh, just to put some perspective on this, there is more DRAM in a Canon R5 than there is memory, uh, same thing, DRAM memory, than there is in an iPad Pro 2020. Those have six gig of RAM and this camera almost certainly has eight. So there's 30%, 33% more memory, and it's possible that the R5's memory is organized so that it's, it's both higher clocked and possibly, um, well, probably the same bus width potentially as the iPad Pro 2020, which I believe is 128 bit now, uh, but probably higher clocked and possibly is wide or maybe wider, depending on how the iPad Pro is actually organized. Now, as I said, memory organization matters because the wider the bus, the more data gets moved around in uh, each transaction. Uh, so, you know, can't really, I, I don't know how Canon actually did it. I'm looking at pictures of their, their camera. I'm not actually like, I don't have their hardware docs. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it's, I don't know. I, I, I went into this, I have to say thinking, well, this is, can't be that bad. Uh, and then coming out of this going like, holy crap, the, this is actually like no joke hardware. Like, you know, I never really thought of my camera as being like a ton of memory bandwidth needed. Um, so, 
yeah, memory bandwidth, uh, there's probably a lot more in your camera than you think. And there's definitely more in your camera than there is in your smartphone. Uh, so power consumption, uh, not to get too in depth into power consumption, but basically that's a consideration. And that's something that, you know, Canon has been flogged for the R5 and the overheating problems uh, when shooting high data rate video, so 8K or 4K 120 or even 4K 60 in the high resolution mode. Uh, and, you know, why is this Canon? What have you done? Uh, but, you know, I think this should hopefully maybe shed some light on just how ridiculous some of this stuff is. Uh, the image sensors, looking, I looked at a whole lot of image sensor data sheets while I was putting this, uh, doing my notes, doing some research for this. And image sensors drawing one to two watts is not unreasonable. And that's heat that has to be dissipated in the camera somewhere, somehow. Um, the, the power consumption for doing, you know, even hardware H264 or H265 compression uh, that is not, you know, especially when you start talking about 8K or 140 frames per second, like we're talking a lot of data needs to be moved. We're talking very complicated math. And that's actually why I, I am even bringing up power consumption. HEVC is not just a bunch of ads. So doing this in camera, which is again, the point that we're kind of talking about, but doing this in camera is a bunch of ads and it's something that the camera needs to, you know, like power consumption, which directly translates to thermal limits, thermal power, you know, thermal uh, stuff in the camera. Uh, should this take as much power as doing like, of HEVC, real-time HEVC compression for video? Probably not. Um, even if it's not being run on special purpose hardware, it's being run on a more generic DSP uh, core, um, it probably shouldn't burn as much power as video compression does. Um, but then going back to that TI DSP I talked about earlier, that was a one watt part, give or take, uh, based on the what I could read about the, 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 the performance. So, you know, if you're throwing another watt burn in the camera, like, you know, that's heat that needs to be dissipated. And that ultimately could be a limiting factor to how long, assuming, you know, the rest of my calculations are reasonable, um, how long the, uh, camera could potentially record a long exposure, uh, you know, before it runs, you know, ignoring the battery situation. Okay, so I have two things left to talk about, and then I am done with this, and then I won't have to stretch this out, because I'm, I'm running long, I don't care, I don't want to do another week on this, I want to get done with it. I want to finish my piece, I want to move on to something else, uh, partly because I realized how much of a mess this has become in some respects. Anyway, um, processing requirements. So the real-time processing requirements, we figured that out earlier. When I was looking at the data for that, I had sort of two questions that kind of came up, which was, if it takes 20 milliseconds to do the processing per frame, which is about what it takes on average for the the fast methods uh what's the best shutter speed that i could shoot at and what's the margin for that so it turns out that the the best shutter speed for a 45 megapixel camera or 45 megapixel frame that takes 20 milliseconds to process just for additions or whatever uh, again using my test code uh is exactly a 50th of a second uh, it, a 50th of a second, you would have a continuous stream of frame gets transferred, gets processed. And as soon as it's done processing, it starts the next frame. There's no room for any overhead or any timing problems. So that's probably not a good, uh, good number. 
A 40th of a second gives you 5 milliseconds of margin, and a 30th of a second gives you 13 milliseconds of margin, and I'm more comfortable with more margin in this case. So this raises a question of, is a 30th of a second fast enough for this to be viable for still photography? Uh, so you'd basically have you know, a, an individual frame shutter speed range of use, just using the camera meter, for example, of a 30th of a second to 30 seconds. And then your long exposure would be stacks and averages of all of that. And the answer to that that I come up with is maybe. If you're shooting during the middle of the day using the sunny 16 rule, which is a shutter speed of one of the uh, one over the ISO at F16 at whatever ISO you're using, uh, for ISO 100, you come up with needing a shutter speed of a hundredth of a second or one twenty-fifth of a second, give or take. Uh, in which case, the answer is no, it's not really fast enough. You need about two to three stops, uh, probably two stops of neutral density. Yeah, you need about two stops of neutral density to get that to where it's usable. Or you need to stop slower ISOs. So if you went down to ISO 50, you'd get down to a 50th or a 60th of a second shutter speed. Uh, Canon cameras don't go to ISO 25, so you'd need to stop a neutral density there. But we did talk in the last video about the idea of expanding the ISO range. So not ending or not starting at 100, but going to 50 or 25 or something like this. And I suggested that uh, you know, it was possible that some expansion would help. So being able, you know, having a base ISO of say 50 or 64 and being able to go down to a 20, to ISO 25 or the equivalent of ISO 25, this is where, how that would help. So if you could make the camera shoot at ISO 25, you could not use a neutral density filter and you would get the amount of a, a slow enough shutter speed, a 30th of a second or thereabouts, to be able to do this with a pretty good amount of overhead uh, or um, margin for other processing happening in the camera. Again, given the kind of numbers that I've come up with based on my test code. Now, the one problem with this is that given modern sensor resolutions, we might not want to shoot at f16 that much anymore. Uh, the R5 is diffraction limited at f8. The A6 or the A Sony A7R4 is diffraction limited at 6.3 or 5.6 or something like that. Uh, so if you want the absolute sharpest images, you kind of and you're shooting with a, a 45, 60, whatever megapixel camera, you probably don't want to shoot at f16, uh, you know, anymore. Now on the flip side. Golden hour exposure times, late afternoon, you know, going into blue hour or whatever, uh, based on the um, breakthrough photography neutral density buying guide, they recommend that you should have a two to four minute exposure, uh, which would be, you know, for your thing, which would be, uh, you know, shooting at ISO 100 at F11 to F18 using a six stop ND filter. So just Two to four minutes minus six stops or divided by six stops or however you want to put it gives us uh, two minutes would be a 1.8 second exposure. Four minutes would be a four second exposure, essentially. Uh, that's easy. That's no problem. In fact, you could do that with the built in averaging basically right now. Uh, you know, if you could get a base exposure of even a second, you can do the, the built in averaging on a camera and you probably won't have artifact problems and you probably won't have uh, you know, visual artifacting problems and you will have way more time shooting than you will have uh, time going back. The only real limitation is, is that the best you're going to get out of a camera that can average up to eight or nine images is three stops of uh, built-in averaging. You know, it's until the camera manufacturers let us do more exposures than eight stop or eight or nine, uh, we're we're going to you know we're, you're limited to that. However, when I was doing this whole thing, I I noticed 
you know, I, I said I started doing video resolutions and I just wanted to see how things sort of played out. And one of the things I noticed is that at, because there's so much less data in, say, 1080p or 4K than there is in a 45 megapixel image, that it actually started looking like it would be possible to do this for video, which I thought was an incredibly interesting thought. Because, again, one of the reasons to use neutral density when shooting video is that you can't get your shutter speeds low enough for the right exposure or, or slow enough for the right exposure. And so you have to do, you know, have to average things down or you have to bring things down with neutral density. So I ran the numbers for 8K, 4K, and 1080p. And I assumed, uh, well, I, I, I ran it for, like I said, 8K, 4K, and 1080p, uh, DCI, because the, the UHD TV formats are smaller, and so there's less information that has to be processed. And so it's actually, uh, if it can do it for DCI, it, it definitely can do it for UHD. And I worked using the... Uh, best possible shutter speed that I came up with based on the microsecond or the amount of processing time. So in a still frame, you have the shutter opens, the shutter closes, the data transfers, you process. And while that's happening, the shutter is opening for the next exposure. And so basically you have however long a shutter, you know, however long the shutter is open minus a bit to get through each, uh, each frame that you're averaging so that you don't have a backlog. So with video, it's basically the same thing, just you, your, your total run time has to be whatever the shutter speed for the video is. Uh, so let's talk, uh, for example, uh, 4K. So 4K, using my numbers, the average was about uh, 4.2 milliseconds to process a frame. Uh, averaging based on, what is it, everything but the, uh, uh, well, I used the, the threaded scalar uh, cumulative moving average and the vector cumulative moving average. So that's the other thing. Doing... Uh, video stuff, you really don't have the luxury, well, I, I guess if it was fast enough, you maybe could do it, but you really don't have the luxury of doing a standard average type thing because your, um, your, 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 you don't have the buff, you, you, like, you, you have to get everything done per each frame to get the frame shipped off on time. So everything has to happen within the frame time. So you would have the exposure part of the frame, and then you could do the divisions in the non-exposure part of the frame, maybe. But it would be preferable to do that all in one time. So this is a place where you definitely would we would need um, a level... Well, actually, what's interesting is you probably could do this without doing arbitrary divisions. Uh, you know, I talked about arbitrary divisions are slow, shifts aren't, and this is something that actually you might be able to do very quickly just using shifts and adds, uh, or shifts, adds, and subtracts. I'd, I'd, I'll be honest, I didn't spend an awful lot of time looking at the code of being able to do this for uh, video. I kind of just went, what's the, like, you know, could it, do the numbers work out in such a way that it's even worth talking about? So for 8K video on a camera like the R5, the answer is no. Uh, the amount of time it takes to process an 8K frame is about a 60th of a second. And so if you're shooting at 24 frames a second, you the best you could do is four tenths of a stop of neutral density, which isn't even a whole stop and so it's not even a whole frame you know whole two frames so not even worth talking about uh 4k though 
based on the time that it takes, which I said is about 4.2 milliseconds based on my test code on my test system, that works out to a, each individual subframe, we'll call it, could have an exposure time of 125th of a second. Uh, that would keep it from stacking, essentially, or, or buffering. Uh, so for 24 frame per second video with 180 degree shutter angle or a 50th of a second shutter, total shutter speed time, uh, you would get 4.7 frames, which works out to be 2.2 stops, which actually is a thing. That's a number that's worth talking about, possibly. For 30 frame per second, so a six, again, 180 degree shutter angle, uh, so a 60th of a second total shutter time, I come up with about 3.9 frames. Now, if you could do it just a touch faster, again, two stops of neutral density is available there. Uh, obviously, at a, uh, and actually, the same thing applies for a 60 frame per second operation. Uh, I take that back. No, for 60, frame per sec, uh, 60 frames per second, you don't have enough time to get it all done uh, or get anything done. So not a viable thing. Uh, but certainly for 24 frames per second, you could potentially have two stops of neutral density available electronically using this process. Uh, for 1080p, um, it took my test code about a millisecond per frame. Uh, in fact, it takes less in a lot of cases, I think. Let me look real quick. Uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll call it a millisecond per frame. Uh, that's about, uh, f well, the, the, you definitely be safe with a 500th of a second shutter speed uh, effective there. So at 24 frames a second, 180 degree shutter angle, you're looking at about 18 and a half frames you could capture in that 50th of a second. I did the math right again. Uh, and I will repeat the disclaimer I made in the previous video. I'm doing this mostly for the fun of it because I find it interesting. So if my math is off, uh, I'm not being paid to do the math. Uh, I tried to make sure it's right, but I always you know, it's entirely possible I could be wrong. But anyway, that gives you about four stops of neutral density, which is pretty impressive in my opinion. Uh, so same thing goes up to 30 frames per second. You get just under four stops. So if you can do it just a little bit faster, you could get that four stops of neutral density uh, digitalized, digitized. And for uh, 60 frames per second, you get 7.4 frames by my possibly wrong math. Uh, which is just under three stops of neutral density. Uh, it's certainly more than two stops of neutral density. And, you know, that's... Uh, I can't say whether it would absolutely work or not, but I can say that it looks like it would be possible at at least 1080p or 4K to be able to use this same technique that, you know, I'm proposing essentially for landscape still photography uh, for digital or for video as a, a synthetic synthesized neutral density technique that you you know it would take four subframes at you know a quarter of the frame or at a quarter of the shutter speed or quarter of the integration time four times the shutter speed however you want to look at it uh, and average them together into the frame that was the half of the frame rate or twice, however you want to look at it, actual shutter time. And that would give you essentially the same effect as putting that neutral density to bring down your fast aperture when shooting video. Uh, now, obviously, this is sort of a flight of fancy thing, talking about video, and it's not something I put a tremendous amount of time into doing the, the research and the math on. Uh, so, moving on to the last discussion, if you will, of this whole thing, which is to talk about the user interface and UI implementation ideas. So, I come down to two kind of thoughts here. First of all, you have to have a good UI for this to be really useful. It has to be better than the what's there now, in my opinion, which is not horrible, but 
I, it would not actually be that difficult to make something better. And there's three approaches in terms of UI design that I thought of when I was doing this that I think are worth talking about. So one is the traditional stops approach. Uh, one is a non-traditional time approach. And the third is a non-traditional slow bulb approach. And the, when I say non-traditional, what I mean are thing is a way of approaching the problem that's completely new relative to what we had for um, stuff in the past. So the traditional approach for neutral density anything is just stops. You have a one-stop neutral density or a 10-stop neutral density or whatever. And there's a processing advantage to working in stops because you don't have arbitrary divisions, uh, potentially, or you shouldn't have. Uh, because you're working in stops, everything is a two to the power of, and two to the power divisions can be done using shifts instead of arbitrary division operations and therefore can be done quickly and therefore there's a possible there, there's potential for uh, speeding things up because you and simplifying the hardware because you don't need the hardware division or you don't need to do the hard division the hardware division in software uh, so working in stops controls the number of frames that need to be captured it also kind of can potentially limit the number of frames that need to be captured so for example if you shoot set it to 10 stops, the camera cla captures 100 or 1,024 frames, divides by 1,024, and uh, that's it, which this explicitly ensures that overflow conditions don't happen. So remember earlier I was talking about having a 32-bit buffer and, you know, how many frames at 12-bit or 16-bit you could get into that buffer, that doing it this way, you don't have, like, that that's not a concern because you just don't let, let people choose more than the number of stops that would fill the buffer. Uh, this also is probably the approach that would be most comfortable for photographers in the sense that it resembles, resembles the behavior of traditional neutral density. Uh, you meter the scene, you get an exposure, you set the neutral density setting to 10 stops or something to that effect, and the camera goes and takes whatever the, the whole thing is, number of stops. I'm honestly, like, I could see having that, but it's I don't think it's the, the best approach. Which brings me to the non-traditional approaches. Uh, one is just a time-based approach. You set how much time you want to record. There's no ND factor anymore because... Everything we're doing here is an average of frames and there's no need essentially is, you know, if you have the division hardware, there's no need to have a, a hard stop or whatever that you can, you can have an odd number of frames. You can shoot and have 625 frames and that's not an even stop or even whatever. It's just the thing. Uh, if you're using the running averages, the, the limits are essentially unlimited. Uh, if you're using the mean technique, the well, the limits are however many frames you can put in a 32-bit accumulator. Or honestly, if you fill up one, you can just start another one. There's plenty of memory in the camera to have three or four or five 32-bit 45 by 45 megapixel buffers and when it comes to the final process you divide each of them by your uh, your average and you combine them together and you get your you know you get you can basically you can split up the division and stuff across them and, and add them together uh, the math is slipping my mind at the moment but you can you can make it work um so doing a time-based approach, basically you have two options. You could either specify a time in minutes and seconds, like just whatever, or you could actually do the stops step kind of idea 
but uses it as extended shutter ranges. So I talked in the last, in my R5 wishlist video about having extended shutter ranges like Nikon has on the Z series cameras where you can go 60 seconds, two minutes, four minutes, eight minutes, 16 minutes, whatever. Uh, that would, this would be an application sort of, uh, of point here is you could do that. So that two hours and 25 minute record time that I came up with, you know, earlier is eight stops past 30 seconds. It's a bit more than eight stops, but we'll just call it eight stops. And a nine hour, 42 minute record time is 10 stops past 30 seconds. And so you could very easily just let people dial in, you know, like I said, either a time, I want a five minute exposure and the camera does the rest essentially, or, you know, a extending the shutter speeds essentially in stops and then the camera figures out how long each sub subframe needs to be. And the final idea that I came up with when I was thinking about this was a neutral density bulb approach. So the cool thing about the averaging technique is that you can have each individual subframe be correctly exposed and you can cut it off at any arbitrary point. So it's not like a neutral density filter where you have to have the shutter speed run for the computed or estimated runtime. You don't have to have an estimated runtime. And so the idea here is this, this would work like bulb where you hold the shutter release closed or down and the camera goes through exposing subframes based on the proper exposure and averaging them. And then the, when you release the shutter, it computes the final, uh, it computes the final, uh, whole shooting match. So, uh, when you release the shutter, it, as it's going, it's counting how many subframes it's taking and it just computes the whole final thing based on the number of subframes that, you know, was there and divides that into your, your numbers. Okay, so finally, the end, and I'm done with this, and I will not be talking about camera armchair camera engineering for a while, I hope. Uh, so conclusions. Well, um, one thing is that I'm not necessarily camera related, but that the processing capabilities to seem to be uh, mostly bandwidth limited, at least on PC hardware. Uh, I just can't seem to get, you know, like I get very consistent results for all of the pro uh, all of the algorithms when I'm flat, you know, for all and all of the picture sizes when I'm flat out using as much or as basically as much bandwidth as I can. And this is something that may actually be alleviated in terms of the camera because it looks like it may have a camera like the R5 looks like it may have more memory bandwidth than a entry level server or entry level desktop PC would have, uh, or even a mid range server and desktop PC would have. Uh, as I said, there's two ways to do this. You could either do it as a running average, or you could do it as a standard arithmetic mean uh, or, or, or mean where you're average, adding up everything during the frame and you're dividing it in post-processing, or not post-processing, but after the frame is captured. Uh, obviously, this is preferably done with the hardware division in the processor and not knowing exactly what Canon is using for their broader core or if there is even that kind of thing, uh, that could be problematic. There are ways to work around this using software to do software division and reciprocal multiplication of fixed point numbers and stuff like that. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this. Uh, that said, even pretty basic processors have, uh, you know, like mobile processors like the ARM Cortex M4, stuff like that. 
does have hardware division capabilities and even though it's relatively slow at up to 12 cycles per operation uh, on a 500 megahertz part um, that's still you're only talking about a second worst case ish to do the divisions for a 45 megapixel image which i don't really think is unreasonable post-processing time it wouldn't even be unreasonable if it was five or ten seconds after you take the picture. Remember, we're not talking about something that you're going to be using for shooting fast action. And so if you just shot a five minute or 10 minute landscape long exposure, the fact that it takes the camera five seconds to process that, I don't think is a real problem. Now, obviously, if the ultimate answer to this is to include hardware to do this one way or another um, which really is probably just hardware division and you do the um, you do the addition you straight up arithmetic mean approach addition in DSPs division after the fact with whatever you have that does hardware division uh, in the camera uh, additionally given that you know given enough power in the camera so enough parallel operations it seems like you could uh well so i guess basically the two big takeaways here for me at least are and you know i'm probably biased or well, i am biased but one is that it appears assuming there's enough computational power in the camera which i think at least for additions there probably is uh you it looks like it would pra be practical to implement synthesized or computational neutral density for most slow-ish shutter speeds so a 30th of a second and slower or you know something in that range um, additionally it looks like it might be possible not maybe in this generation of cameras but maybe in the next generation of cameras to be able to do some synthetic computational um, neutral density type work for video at reasonable size, uh, reasonable resolution. So maybe not 8K, but definitely 1080p and probably 4K uh, at moderate or at the slower end of the frame rate spectrum. So maybe not 60 frames a second, although for four, 1080p, it looked like it possible to be doing to do it there but probably for 24 and 30 frames per second, which I think would be very interesting to have kind of as a video shooter. It, you know, if you wanted to shoot wider apertures and not, you know, you, you could, you know, you might still need some neutral density, but you'd be able to potentially get away with less neutral density. And of course, going back to the, the last video, one of the advantages of stacking and averaging is it increases the signal to noise ratio so you get better looking picture or better looking video out of this process, you know, again, assuming everything is fast enough. So this ended up being a two hour video and, you know, I'm, I would apologize for that, but on the same token, I'd rather not have taken this out to being a third week on this topic. I'd like to move on to something else. If you manage to make it through this whole video, thank you very much for watching. If you found this interesting, please smash that like button. If this kind of technical content, and I'm not always going to be talking about armchair engineering for camera, but technical, more on the technical end of photography and videography is up your alley. Please consider subscribing. Again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week on the live stream and in the next video. Later.